Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell, and this is the week of Dice Tower Con. Uh, we're very excited about that. If you're watching this, maybe you're coming to Dice Tower Con. Maybe you're not, and that's okay. Uh, but maybe you can come in a future year. And if you'd missed Dice Tower Con, Dice Tower Cruise is still coming up later this year. But Dice Tower Con is happening this week, so there will be no live Q and A today. Um, despite the fact that we're having some kind of streaming problems anyway, we're trying to get that fixed. Um, but there's going to be, there's still Weekend Review, which went up this week. And we're not going to have a ton of videos this week. We're going to be trying to stream stuff from Dice Tower Con. So if you're not there, you can feel a little bit like you are there. Uh, but we're excited about that. I did a video last week where it talks about, if you're going to Dice Tower Con, here's ideas and tips and things about that. And I'm not even here right now. I'm already there at the Cree Royale Hotel. So despite all that, and you say, Tom, I don't want to hear about Dice Tower Con. I can't go. Fair enough. Let's talk about other things, and we're going to start with the news. Okay, well, first of all, we have Total Recall, the license for Total Recall. It's called Total Recall, the official board game. I never understand why the word official needs to be in the title of these. Is there unofficial versions of these board games? I know that there is occasionally, but still, it just seems kind of like, okay, we get it. Anyway, the license has been picked up. Uh, by Overworld Games. You'll know them because their best well-known game is Good Cap, Bad Cap, which they have remade and are now remaking again uh, with the Total Recall theme. How many times can we make one game? I don't know. Check with AEG. Um, and they're even having a not-safe-for-work version of it. Uh, I guess it's because of blood and gore. Anyway, this one's exciting news, I think. Perplexed Games uh, with, has, is coming out with a series of games from Chris Handy, um, called uh, Roland Writer. Uh, this is a series of dice games, and the main character of this series is supposed to be a mix of Kinesia, uh, Reiner Kinesia, and Willy Wonka. And so he's done, uh, Chris Handy's done the pack of games. These are the little games that look like gum, and they come in a little pack, and they're all very small with any cards. Well, this is going to be similar, but it's going to be involving dice. So that seems interesting. Simon has announced they have the rights to Grizzled now. Didn't they always produce Grizzled? No, they actually just distributed Grizzled um, for the publisher in the United States. Now Simon pretty much owns Grizzled. Green Couch has announced a game called Before Earth Explodes. This is a game in which you're trying to save humanity, which sounds grandiose and big, but Green Couch Games always does their games very small. When you look at the components, there's not a whole lot in there. So it will be interesting to see what this game is like. The Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition, which came out almost 10 years ago, is coming back in. This is a huge one, one that was very popular, uh, was to celebrate the 40th anniversary of uh, Avalon Hill when it came out or something like that. Anyway, it's coming back. Also from Hasbro, Hasbro Monopoly Gamer. This is a Super Mario game of Monopoly, which looks like they tried to change it up a lot in the sense that you're moving around and you're shooting green shells at people in front of you. When you land on spots, obviously you're paying in coins, but it looks like it's not simplified. It looks almost like it's Super Mario landed in a Monopoly board and decided to run around it. Is that good? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know. Three unnew lock games have been announced. The House on the Hill, which looks horror-filled. The Nautilus uh, and Tonopol's Treasure, which is on a... Uh, uh, and it looks like Treasure Island, Submarine, and then Scary. Unless the first one's not scary, but it sure looks scary. That's great. More unlocked games is always good. There's a Planet of the Apes board game. Now, we've talked about in the past the Planet of the Earth's miniature game, but there's now a board game coming out uh, from IDW, and this one is designed by Richard Launius, the king of thematic games. Uh, Fantasy Flight has announced a new expansion, the Uthuk Yaluin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't even care. For Rune Wars, there's a new army expansion, so they're really pushing Rune Wars. I'm curious if Rune Wars is really taking off in places. I'm not hearing a lot of talk about it, but Fantasy Flight is certainly going to give it the good old heave-ho push. Not heave-ho, but sorry, wrong terminology. WizKids has announced several new games, but one that caught my eye is Wartime. Now, Wartime is a game that I looked at a few years ago, actually, as a possible Dice Tower Essentials line. 
And I ultimately said no because I thought it was too esoteric. I thought it was a little too odd for most people because this game is a war game between two players, but you have timers and you flip the timer and that will let you move different people on the board. So you're flipping timers and some, some units can move faster, so their timer is faster. Some will take longer. I thought the idea was great. I really enjoy it. It's not going to be for everybody, though. If you don't like speed games and war games and, you know, something that seems very specific, you won't like it. But if you do, it's a really neat idea, and I really like the cover also. Hansem Gluck is trying to trademark the term meeple. What does this mean? I don't know. Maybe they're just doing it so that they have it. I mean, obviously, Carcassonne came from them. So they were the first ones to do it, although they never coined the word meeple. The word meeple was actually coined by an American um, years or, you know, after Carcassonne came out. If they do copyright this, does that mean you can't use it in the rules of your game? Can you use the shape? And if not, you can just modify the shape. Seems a little odd to me, especially considering how long after Carcassonne has come out that they're doing this. Who knows? It may or may not go through. And if it does go through, it may not mean anything anyway. That's the news. Let's head over to Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody. And to my friends in the U.S., happy 4th of July this week. And better yet, happy Dice Tower Con week. But before all of that, I've got a few projects to show you. So let's get going. It just so happened to work out that this is going to be an animal-centric segment, starting off with There She Is. There She Is is a cooperative card game based on a Korean cartoon about a rabbit named Nabi who falls in love with a cat named Doki. So, you know, just your typical love story. Players work together to complete the five steps to ensure Nabi and Doki have a happy romance. To complete those steps, you're using cards and abilities to find specific objects within the deck. You'll also be collecting positive sign tokens and animals to help you pass events. But there are also negative sign cards that could cost you the game. There are over 200 object cards within the game, and they all have different game impacting abilities. There are also 11 different character cards, each with their own abilities as well. There She Is has enough charm and cute factor to woo backers who have no familiarity with the show it's based on, and you can get a copy for $28 plus shipping. Featuring a cast of anthropomorphic animals, Paws and Padlocks is a family-friendly dungeon crawl with a nice puzzly element. Keys are the crucial element in the game as these can unlock, open, and rotate rooms. You'll be exploring the dungeon, encountering monsters, discovering treasure and loot, and can even go shopping for potions and other helpful items. But ultimately, you're trying to find the three crystal keys that will let you nab the big treasure. Watch out because rooms can relock and even disappear, and you need to grab the treasure and escape before any of your opponents. A copy of Paws and Padlocks takes a pledge of $29, or for $39, you'll also get the Royal Expansion Pack. Rabbit Island is a 4x tile lane game that is pretty streamlined for relatively quick play. Players take on the role of a rabbit tribal leader who have journeyed to a new land to claim as their home. Of course, carrots are a primary currency in Rabbit Island, and you'll be laying tiles to form this land, building camps to claim tiles, and collecting carrots to upgrade your territories for points. As a 4X game, you can also conquer opponents' territories, and there are action cards that give player advantages or disadvantages. The tile lane element ensures the island map changes game to game, and Rabbit Island's art is really reminiscent of kind of classic storybook art styles. You can get a copy of Rabbit Island for a pledge of $36. And in Ducklings, players pair up as the parents to a little flock of three baby ducks, and you have to work together to travel to safety before winter. The path is formed randomly by cards that you lay out, and events are seated among the deck that are full of hazards, from predators to people to blizzards. As little wee duckies get harmed, they gain affliction tokens, and when a duck gets three of those, you have to flip its card. And trust me, you do not want to flip that card. Each duckling has a special ability that they lose if they flip. But on the other hand, you move faster the fewer ducks you have, and winter is coming. And while you're working with your partner, you can actually work against an opponent's flock of duckies, adding this kind of duck-take-that element. 
Ducklings allows you to adjust the length of play by changing the number of events in the deck, and the baby ducks all have adorable names like Mo and Annabelle, which makes flipping them so very, very sad. You can get a copy of Ducklings for a pledge of $20 plus shipping. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And if you're going to Dice Tower Con later on this week, make sure you say hi and maybe we can play a game together. Until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. I know I'm going to. Is it possible to inadvertently ruin a game by being too considerate? Hi, I'm Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, and every time I attend a board game convention or local event where people bring their own games from home to be played, there is always one question that I hear asked that day. As a player grabs for a deck of cards belonging to someone else's game, they will ask that game's owner, do you have a preference in how your cards are shuffled? A riffle shuffle? Or overhand? It's an understandable common courtesy, as some people feel that riffle shuffling puts unnecessary extra wear and tear on a game's cards. And if riffle shuffling is nixed, the most common method of shuffling used instead seems to be the overhand shuffle. Problem solved, right? The owner and their game are treated with respect, and uh, the cards all get shuffled up. But does overhand shuffling really randomize the cards as well as riffle shuffling? Is the problem really solved, or have we just replaced one issue with another? Well, according to Stanford University mathematician Percy Diaconis, on average, after seven riffle shuffles, a standard deck of 52 playing cards has more possible permutations than there are particles in the universe. Riffle shuffling may theoretically put more strain on the cards, but <laughs> you gotta admit, that, that's, that's pretty well randomized. Uh, by comparison, to achieve the same level of randomization using the overhand method, the cards would need to be shuffled roughly 10,000 times. If each overhand shuffle action takes, say, half a second to complete, the deck would still need to be overhand shuffled for nearly one and a half hours in order to achieve the same level of randomness achieved with just seven riffle shuffles. So, if... Comparing the randomness to property damage ratio of the two methods of shuffling in that respect, well, then riffle shuffle starts to seem like actually the less destructive option. But there are also other viable methods of shuffling, each with their own pros and cons. So which method of shuffling do you find provides you with the best compromise between randomization and wear and tear on the deck? Riffle shuffling? overhand shuffling, or another method? In the comments below, let me know your top priority when it comes to shuffling cards. Randomization or component longevity? So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Um, well, I can't say a whole lot, really. There's a few videos you'll see tomorrow. Um, I'm doing a, a preview of Immortals. Not a preview, but like a first impressions of Immortals from Queen Games. I'm doing my the best of Haba. No, not Haba. Of Greater Than Games. Sorry. Haba's coming next week. And a, a few other things. Um, but it's mostly going to be live videos from Dice Tower Con, assuming our streaming works. So we're going to be streaming a couple game shows. We're going to be streaming the Dice Tower uh, a, des a designer panel will be streaming the Dice Tower Awards. That's the big one. The Dice Tower Awards are going to be announced this Friday. Who's won? Well, you're going to have to come on and watch and see. So, and we'll also be streaming um, a live top 10 list, which is a lot of fun. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that stuff. And we're also going to have a camera that's just sitting on the convention, just looking out there. So you can turn it on for background noise or ignore it or whatever you want. But if you just want to kind of look at Dice Tower Con, and maybe people come by and wave at the camera. I don't know. But, well, that's what's coming out this week. Don't forget, of course, we have our podcast coming out, and all oh, lots of great podcasts in the Dice Tower Network. Certainly check that out at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Hello, everyone.
everyone, my name is Annette and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over Morta Morosa. Now Morta Morosa offers a unique mechanism involving sound. So let me show you exactly how it's applied in the game and what makes this game so unique. So here we have Morta Morosa. As you can see, there's a huge tower in the center. We're going to have an investigation sheet because we're all investigating who killed these two victims in the hotel. After the victims have been placed in the hotel, every player is going to drop two of their own personal cubes in the tower. There are two acts to the game, and the first act is searching for the victims. If someone finds the victims, then they go ahead and find the crime scene. So they take out the victims and note where they located those victims on what floor in their investigation sheet. Once we find the victims, then we begin the second phase. The second phase is to figure out who did it. So during the process of the game, you're basically going to look for other players or cover your own tracks by announcing and taking those cubes out and placing them on the investigation sheet. If you don't find them, then you go ahead and place one of your own cubes in there. You listen and you try to figure out and deduce where that cube is located to further your investigation. So as you can see, Morta Morosa is super unique and different because all players are using their sense of sound. Everyone's sitting around the table and listening to where the cubes are falling. So you don't necessarily know if they're your cubes or someone else's cubes. It's always just kind of a press your luck element. But the main mechanism is sound and just listening. So that's what makes Morta Morosa a super unique game and why I like it a lot. Well, thanks a lot and I'll see you next time. Hey, this is Mike with Board Game Makeover. In this episode, I'm gonna show you the top five games that I won't even touch. And the reason why. Number five, Roll for the Galaxy. Why won't I touch this game? A lot of games that have a lot of dice with special characters on them, I'm not going to re-theme it or put some other component. I like dice. I like throwing dice. And the symbols on the dice, they're there for a reason, to make the game you know, thematic in its own way. And I don't want to go through and every six-sided die or 12 or 20-sided die. I'm not going to change that out. Too much work and probably not worth the effort I'd put into it. Number four, Ravenspire. This is a Kickstarter back game that I received. I have not played this game yet. I'm trying to get my gaming group to play it, but they're so, uh, no, bring out Catan, please. Let's try something new. This game is huge, lots of cards, but the board, it's a circular board that changes. It looks intriguing to me. I really want to try this game out and just kind of give it a go. It's, a, it's one of those where the game board's always changing. And I don't think I'd want to change out the game board on this to a different theme or this game itself. There's a lot of work in this game to do. And most of the time, the reason I don't change out a game, give it a makeover, is because it's a lot of work. And I only have about a week, maybe two weeks to get things done most of the time. Number three, Millennium Blades. Great game, but a kabillion cards. And there's no way I'm going to change out a theme. That's got a really great theme as it is. No, just... Too much to do. I already like the game as it is. A lot of fun. Let's leave that one alone. <laughs> Number two. Zaya. What a great game. I just love the theme of this game. The way it is, it's all set up so nicely. I love the way the ships are built. A lot of fun built into it that I don't want to ruin. And the number one game that I won't touch is... Cthulhu Wars. <clears throat> Cthulhu Wars. Those huge miniatures, what would I do? Use the miniatures in some other theme perhaps, but I like the game as it is. The miniatures are amazing. I know they're oversized and some people think that that's just too much, but I still like them. This is my number one game that I will not give a board game makeover to. So as you can see, I have to really evaluate a game to see if it really needs a makeover. And if a lot of times it's based on my personal preferences, my thematic preferences, component preferences. So a game has to have a need for it to give, for me to give it a board game makeover. Thanks for watching the board game makeover. I will see you at Dice Tower Con or the next episode that I put out there.
The raid is over, and the victorious Vikings gather in the chieftain's tent to divide the spoils of war. Piled high on a massive oak table are the best treasures taken during the raid. Gleaming gems, shiny swords, fine armor, and magical artifacts. Once strong allies, the Vikings are taken by greed, and soon a heated debate ensues. Who will get the spoils? <laughs> the village was pillaged! It was a great success! What a horde we have here! And of course, being Leif, the chief Viking, I deserve the greatest spoils. It was a fine job you did leading of the village from the boat by the shore, my liege. Uh, while the rest of us risk life and limb uh, defeating the villagers for a century. Tactics, uh, tactics. Well, tactics only go so far. Obviously, uh, the, the warriors on the uh, on the village uh, should be the ones that should be. Ah, the warriors. You hardly shed even any of your blood. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 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 by my leader, of course. Uh, yes, yeah, of a, course. a fair amount should 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 go to you, of course. But um, I, as as your most industrious uh, second in command, who had the wonderful idea of attacking the village at night, um, obviously the larger share uh, should go go to myself. Uh, Olaf, you understand? Yes. Olaf needs gold. Yes, yes, yes. So here, here, this is this is for you. Yes. Well, well good, done. Good portion. Good, good, good job. portion. Good job. Good job. Good good no, 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 Olaf, no eat. Yes, no yes. Eat. And a greatest warrior, perhaps, perhaps this 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 stick here, um, to for to to commemorate you, or or or. Well, you know, I do like this. My lady, I can't help but notice that you are you seem to be uh, uh looking... inspecting the coins. Oh, we, here, if, we, sir. If, we could, if we could have those, making back. sure that they're um in, uh, <laughs> the finest cut. Yes, well... Um, Nothing but the best. I've had enough of this nonsense! Enough! We shall divide the spoils by a game of chance. Hmm. <laughs> Only the wisest, cunningest. Well, that means well, the it, smart ones. Oh, well then, then I'm all for this if it is the wise and the smart. I. It'd be a game of cunning, brilliance, strategy, bluffing. <laughs> I did! He's in! Are you in? Are you in? Olaf win game! Ah! We shall divide the spoils of war! Dice games are really fun. I love chucking dice. Yeah, and dice games are a great way to introduce the idea of probability math to young kids. Proba what? Well, maybe you don't want to use the word probability right away, and we'll talk about that later, but it's a great way to help your kids to figure out what they need next. Also, dice will help you to teach them how to create sequence and maybe sets of numbers. And that's why today on Time to Learn, we're talking about Sagrada. In the game of Sagrada, we are all artists trying to build the most beautiful stained glass windows using colorful dice as our piece of glass. Sagrada is a really fun game. I love making colorful designs on the board with the dice, and I just love the creative design in general on these boards. It takes 10 turns to play the full game. Uh, it can be dragging a little bit, but not very much. It's a small complaint. I think. The game overall is fairly quick. It doesn't take too long to play the game. I think it's great that you have to place the dice on the board in specific ways. And I also liked all the colored patterns. Sagrada is definitely a great game. Uh, it became one of the favorite in our family. We have played a couple dozen of games just this week. Um, and right after the first game, we could notice that she was trying to figure out, okay, which numbers I can get, or which colors I can get, just by the, the dice that came out. Uh, I remember the situation, she said, okay, there's four dice that are yellow, one die that is blue, I um, may not get my color, so this is probability, which we'll talk about later on. <laughs> but I guess that's all for us today. See you around the table. Bye. Bye. It's time to learn. Time to learn. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. <laughs>
Cha-cha-cha! Huh. Hmm. Where's Nick? <laughs> oh, God! Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey, man, what's up? Hey, dude, do you notice anything different about us? What do you mean, like that we're Legos now? Yeah, man, pretty much. Yeah, but it's kind of cool. Look what I can do. Oh! Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool, but I was hoping for something a little more adventurous. Ooh, I got just the thing. Is that more adventurous? Yeah, dude, thanks. So this is Lego Creator. This is a roll and move game where every player is going to be given a different schematic of the Lego creation they're trying to build. But to build it, we need some Legos. So you're going to roll and move and go around the board, which allows you to get different Lego bricks from the middle. Certain spots let you pick one brick just from the general brickyard. Some make you pick very specific colors of bricks, like blue or white. And then some let you pick a special brick from the middle, which are more rare. And the last kind of spot lets you take one brick from another player, Mini get all the bricks you need for your schematic. Once you have them all, you build it as fast as possible. The first person to finish their creation wins. So that was Lego Creator. But this is a fun little game where you're kind of, you know, just trying to build your thing. And so I think it's a good time for like a family to play. Especially if I was a kid, like this would be the funnest game. Cause it's yeah. like, yeah, you get to roll around, get bricks, you know, the schematic, the things you're building are very, very easy. Um, I just think it'd be super fun if you were a kid. And I think, like, the thing that we could do, since we are a little bit older, is we try to play talisman style, where you can actually choose which direction you want to yeah. go. I just think it'd be so cool. If you could make, like, a good game that has strategy, you know, is kind of deep, and I think it'd be so much fun mm -hmm. to have one of those things. Just make it for us. Don't even do it for the kids. Yeah. We okay. want the Legos. Yeah, really, that's your market, is this, like, Legos. like middle-aged dudes. You know, I'll play this Lego game. I'll play it. You know, what? I'm going to build a big crane or going to smash through a building. Yeah. Ha. Yeah. Ah. It's co-op game. <laughs> it's co-op. Do check us out on social media and all of these fantastical places below. Social media. So much more content. And also, if you find any great thrift store finds, please let us know on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. And uh, until next time. We'll see you at the thrift store. See you there. Could a game that's about creating characters and RPGs actually be fun? Hi, I'm Chris Renshaw from the Boards and Zords podcast, and welcome to Role Playing. At Origins this year, I had the opportunity to try a game that, judging by the title of this segment, you'd think I'd already have played, and that is Role Player. Now, Role player is a game where you draft dice and use those dice to create your standard fantasy RPG character. You have a series of stats and you're trying to use three dice in each stat to get within a specified range for the type of character that you're making. And depending on how well you do, you get victory points for that. In addition, you also draft cards which give you abilities, equipment, and armor which help fully flesh out your character. Now, when I played this game, I actually really enjoyed it. And I, I think it's a really awesome game, especially if you're someone that's never really ventured into the role-playing game space and you're kind of curious as to what it's all about. It's a good way of introducing you to concepts like strength, dexterity, charisma, stats that you commonly see in these type of fantasy games. And it kind of gives you those tropes. Of this is the kind of stuff that you're looking for if you're going to make a thief if this is the kind of stuff for a barbarian, whatever. Plus the game was really neat and fun. It was fun for me and if you've ever played role-playing games, then you'll probably get a kick out of it too. Or if you're even interested in all, then I highly suggest you check out Role Player and give it a shot. You might like it. Have you tried Role Player? Do you think it's a good intermediary for getting someone interested in RPGs? Let me know down in the comments below. In the meantime, I'll see you next time, and may all your hits be crits. Hey folks, today I want to talk about something that uh, Joel emailed and asked a question. He says, with all the games reviewers get for free, how do you keep from becoming too desensitized to the cost of buying games? Or do you think this is even a potential issue? Now he did say in here that he's not talking about the, the free games and bias towards the games because the game is free. That's a different topic and I've discussed that before, but it is an interesting topic, right? We get a lot of games that come into the Dice Tower. I mean, there's uh, over on my side here, there's 100 plus games 
that come in that we're going to review. And we aren't sitting there budgeting how much we're going to spend towards games. Well, don't blame me. There's a lot of things in our budget that we worry about and deal with like normal humans. Uh, but we buying games isn't really one of them because the games come in. So are we desensitized? For example, he says, I wish I had minis instead of standees. Or I wish the box was bigger so I didn't take the components apart. Um, or, you know, he says, when I hear comments like this, I instantly start thinking of the $10 to $40 that such upgrades would add to my costs for getting the game. At that point, it goes from enjoying a game with less than optimal components to never playing a game with fantastical components. I don't think, says Joel, that I've ever heard a reviewer say, I just wish this game didn't cost so much or was more affordable, or if they had just made this or that compromise of design, more people would be able to afford this great game. What good is a game with the best components in the world if it becomes too expensive to buy? Um, I... I... I understand what you're saying, right? And, and it, it certainly is something to think about, right? As you, as you look at games, and certainly we'll say things like, oh man, I wish this was bigger. Now, that hasn't happened often, but there are a couple times where he said, this is ridiculously overproduced. Um, Cthulhu Wars comes to mind, or just these games are extremely expensive. And games are getting more and more expensive. I've talked about that before, though. I'm still a little kind of mind boggled that people don't realize that games are going to get more expensive because the cost of living in general just gets more expensive. And at $100 for a game today, compared to what you would spend $100 on, say, 20 years ago, $100 has a very different value. Games are getting more expensive, though. However, not all of them are, right? For every new, big, grandiose game that comes out that uh, costs $100, there are many, many, many smaller games come out. I mean, there are tons of tiny games that cost $10, $20, $25 that are out all the time, and these games are fantastic. If they're cutting costs to make it more affordable to people, that is something that I do understand. I, I actually have discussions many times. I'll talk to the guys at Arcane Wonders, for example, the Dice Tower Essentials, and I'll say, why can't we do this in a game? And they're like, well, that would add, that would, we'd have to sell the game for an extra $5. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. That would be a hard sell for people. But I think sometimes when it comes to like a big game, let's say Descent or, you know, these other games, I think having big, grandiose, special uh, components was worth the cost. The cost is really kind of just there. Um, it's, it's like a luxury item. Board games are luxury items anyway, so I'd rather pay more. This is from personal benefit. I'd rather pay more for a bigger, better game. This is the same kind of thing I feel about freemium games on, on phones and things like that where I'd rather pay for a game and get all the things for that game than pay almost nothing for it and have less features than I pay for them later on. I don't like that, that concept at all. So that's the way it is with the game, right? You could get a cheaper game and then pay for all the other stuff and I'd rather just pay for one big grandiose game. Would I have all the games that I have now without them coming in? Well, I, I actually know the answer to that and the answer is yes because I did have this many games before all the games came in. Um, I would go out and buy games that I thought were really good, and if the game was too expensive, then I wouldn't buy it. But, or I would say, you know what, rather than getting two smaller games, I'll get this one bigger game. I found that a lot of people who complain about the price of games are often because they want to buy 10 or 20. And even though we review hundreds and hundreds of games in the Dice Tower, we don't recommend that you just go out and buy tons and tons of games. Find a game you really love. Now, granted, you're right. Cutting out miniatures from, let's say, Arena of the Gods, the game that, that, that was referenced in this email, you know, having it be cardboard stand-ups and having the pieces where you have to disassemble them to put them back in the box, you're right. That makes the cost of the game cheaper. And if that makes the game work, then I'm for that. But for me personally, I might like those things. And I can see that the game would cost more when those things are added. And it's kind of a balancing point. You're saying if you were buying it, or because it comes for free, would you change how you feel? And I don't know, because I, I, I don't know. But I do know that before the games were coming in as review copies, it certainly was something that I would look at and say, I can get a bunch of these smaller games, or I can get this one really nice game of miniatures, and I would tend to gravitate towards that one really nice game. Of course, if the game is any good or not. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule. This is not something that I think everyone should agree with me on. And it's certainly one that I'm sure will inspire lots of comments in the comment section below. And I certainly understand that. Games are more expensive. At the same time, people are spending more money on them. So I don't know that it's on the company's disfavor to not make these big grandiose games. 
And I think for every fantastic big game that comes out, there are many fantastic small ones that come out too. So it's not like you're not allowed to have fun. And you say, but I really want to buy that game. Why couldn't they make it cheaper? I think it's some similarities to like this Apple computer here. They could cut a whole lot of features out of this computer and make it cheaper. But would it still be a fantastic Apple computer at that point? I don't know. These are things we can debate about. Go for it. Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Designer Kane Klenko has designed a number of games with solo variants that are very highly regarded. Games like Dead Men Tell No Tales, Fuse, and Flatline. I'd like to shine a solo mode spotlight today on his most recent game with a solo variant, and that is Flip Ships, designed by Kane Klenko and distributed by Renegade Games. Let's head to the table and take a look. In Flip Ships, you're attempting to defend your planet from waves of oncoming alien ships. They all have different movement patterns and different amounts of damage that they deal, and they're going to be steadily advancing closer and closer to your atmosphere and eventually uh, attacking your planet. To defend, you've got your ships that you're going to be launching by flipping that disc onto, hopefully, those alien cards. Uh, you land potentially on them, and you can destroy them. As they continue to come down, they're going to continue to cause damage to your planet. As they reach certain levels, you are going to potentially unlock more powerful ships that have greater abilities. Every ship is going to have particular abilities, and as they go on, they get more and more powerful. Eventually, you're attempting to take out all of the enemy ships. There's more in a deck over there. The size of the deck depends on the, the uh, difficulty you'd like to have. And if you're able to knock those out, you eventually are going to take on the giant mothership where you have to launch from here to there and get in a certain number of attacks on the mothership, again, depending on difficulty. So there you have it. Flip Ships. If the idea of Space Invaders, the board game, appeals to you, take a look at Flip Ships. Thank you so much, and have a great day. On this week's segment, What Should I Get? We have someone trying to look for a four-player, very competitive game for their group of friends. So, let's go ahead and see what we got for them. Hi, this is Gary Pope from Late to the Table. This is What Should I Get, where we basically go on the board game subreddit on Reddit and look under the What Should I Get mega thread there that's post basically daily and suggest games for people. So, let's go ahead and start. Kaluski Koos is looking for... Kaluski Koos... Kaluski Koos is looking for a game for them and their four friends. They're trying to look for a very competitive game that works along the lines of games like Game of Thrones and Blood Rage. As long as the game's between two to four hours and they're perfectly fine with it. Now, Definitely a game I would suggest for this would 100% be Comet. It's by far one of the most competitive games on the market right now because it basically primarily focuses on fighting. Sometimes by your second turn you may already be in a fight. Now another game I would definitely would suggest would be Comet. Now with Comet's wide variety of powers, the game changes almost every single game. I played this game at least 40 times and I've easily I'm always coming up with new strategies to play the game with. It's very diverse and it's a very great competitive game, especially for replay build. Replay value. That's the word. I would also suggest <laughs> my editor Gary's thinking I'm gonna suggest Comet again. Um no, I'm not gonna suggest Comet again. You could go ahead and bring on the next game. Kluski Kus Ku Klus. Kluski, just get yourself commit. Just do yourself a favor. Just get yourself commit. It's that simple. Just get commit. And that was another episode of What Should I Get. Be sure to go to the board game subreddit on Reddit and check out the What Should I Get mega thread that's there that posts just about on a weekly bait. Did they change the entire name of that, the mega thread? So, I gotta change the entire name of the segment now. Are you kidding? The. <laughs> I gotta change the entire name of this segment now, are you kidding me? What? Bonjour à tous. I love cycling. 
And the biggest, baddest race of them all is the Tour de France, a multiple stage bicycle race through France and nearby countries. And this is my lucky year because the Tour de France starts right here in my hometown, Dusseldorf. The leader in the overall standings wears a yellow jersey. If a rider has red numbers, it means he was the most combative in the previous stage. And that red triangle right over there is called Le Flamme Rouge and marks the last kilometer of each stage. This week I am playing a game that simulates a stage from the Tour de France in a real exciting way. This week I am playing Flamme Rouge. In Flamme Rouge, each player controls two riders, a ruler and a sprinter, each with their own deck of cards. The goal of the game is to have one of those riders be the first one at the finish line. You do this by drawing four cards from one of the rider's decks and choose one of those cards that will determine how fast your rider is going. You do that for the other rider as well. Of course you want to go fast, but you will never want to lead the pack because players behind you will slipstream and get free movement, but also you will get a fatigue card into your deck and those fatigue cards will add up in the end. The game is easy and a lot of fun. You can make new tracks with the double-sided tiles that are provided in the game and you should always add mountains. I do not want to play it with two players again, but a three and four player really is a blast. There's going to be a five and six player expansion at Essen this year, so I'm really looking forward to that one. I love cycling and I love Flum Rouge. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Hello friends, welcome to the best and the worst and today we are talking about civilization. Who does not like a civilization game? A good one. Let's jump into it. Civilizations is for me a really perfect gateway, gateway resource management game. Everything is so smooth. You always have these eight cards. Pick two, one face up, one face down, and then doing your action. And what's really cool on this, uh, the more people taking the action, uh, it differs the very... Uh, the power of the card. So if only one takes it, you gain two. If two takes it, you gain three. But if three or more, you gain one. So that's a really, really cool and nice mechanism. Very fast, nice. Everyone can, can understand that game. It's brilliant. So it's really a gateway resource hand management game that's really that awesome. I cannot judge say more than awesome. The only downside of this game is the quality of these components. These are victory points and you may see it here. These are tiny little paper chips. No, it's, it's a little bit it's not cardboard. It's just thick paper. So this is really oh gosh. Uh, it, it's like paper money in every other game, so it it sucks. The rest is good and the price point is low. I really appreciate that. But these victory point tokens, oh my gosh. That was my favorite part and the thing I don't like too much on Civilizations from Grana and Passport Game Studios. See you next week here live on the Board Game Breakfast. My name is Niels. Bye bye. Enjoy playing. And it's time for another look at the shelf here. This is another shelf in my collection. Here I have Thunder Alley. This is a fantastic racing game uh, with drafting. It's more complex. It's probably the most complex racing game I have. It's not the most complex racing game, but there's just a lot going on. But what I like about Thunder Alley, especially when you play with lower number of players, is you have a ton of race cars. Galaxy Trucker and another big expansion and the big expansion. It's all, everything is in these two boxes plus their missions. There's a ton of Galaxy Trucker. Probably more Galaxy Trucker than I'll ever play with at this point. There's so much for it. But I love this real-time game. New York Slice Pizza. I really like Piece of Cake. And I may actually have kept Piece of Cake. I don't know. I'm not seeing it around here anywhere. I like both themes. The pizza theme and all. This made the game slightly better. Um, a little bit more going on with special tiles. Highly recommend it. Codex. I managed to fit everything for Codex in a big box and a small box. There is a ton of, this is a great, one of my favorite two-player games, a good mix between Magic the Gathering, Summoner Wars, uh, deck building game, which sounds like it shouldn't work, but they all mix together to make a fantastic game. Then I have some large six-sided dice here for no reason at all. This snake, which I saw in the store one time, and he's guarding some dice tower dice. You can see pairs of dice here. And then an aardvark is sitting back here for whatever reason. And folks, that's what's on the shelf.
this week. Hey everyone, it's lunchtime. So today we're taking a look at the game Destination X. The game is published by Aporta Games. It's created by Christian Otsby and Bard Tusith. Plays two to 10 players for ages 10 and up in about 30 to 45 minutes. So this game is a one versus many. The idea is one player is gonna be the spy and of the six cards that are out, they're gonna choose one to be the country that they're hiding out in. So they have information on this top secret book and it's gonna have information on agriculture, population, capital, and all the other players are trying to find the spy and arrest him. So they have to ask questions, but they have cards and the cards determine what question they're looking at, like what information they're gonna get. Capital city or most po like population, GDP, so in addition to it just being a really fun party game, it's a little bit of a trivia game too. So it kind of gets all that old dusty memories from you know when you went to high school for geography and history and politics. It brings it all out again. I'm gonna ask land borders. How many land borders does the country you're gonna have? My country has six land borders. <laughs> okay. So I'm well, thinking Russia sounds kind of good. Or Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. Azer Azer South Africa could, in theory, have a wow. few, but not six, so. Okay, well, that would narrow it down to probably one of these not being one of the ones he said. Okay. So, okay, so that was Vietnam? a good one. Do you think Vietnam could be? Or could well, we no, say? he wouldn't be in. No, that's, he wouldn't be in. I don't think he would be here. In St. Kitts, either. No. no we, could, we could rule out St. Kitts. Although St. Kitts, I'm trying to think of where it is compared to all the other islands, because there's a lot of small ones, but some of them are also broken off, and I don't remember where St. Kitts is. I think St. Kitts is one of the ones that's broken off. Mm, it could be, and Nevis, so it's St. Kitts and, and Nevis. And Nevis, yeah. So I would be safe in saying that one could be ruled out. Okay, so let's, let's go, go with that, that you're St. not yes. in St. Kitts and Nevis. I am not in St. Kitts and Nevis. So that's gonna go, bye-bye. That actually goes out of the game, and uh, you need to draw one. back up. I really enjoyed this game. Uh, the rules say the sneakiest player should be the, the spy, the one, and everyone else should be the many. It's definitely a game where it's like quieter. Like when we play Avenue, which is another reported game, yeah. it's loud and everyone's laughing, making lots of noise. You're still having fun with this one, but now you're concentrated in the thinking. And I think it's a great way to learn a bit of geography, you know, and you learn a bit about the different countries because there, I'm even learning things. I'm like, oh, I never knew that. So just when you're certain about facts, this <laughs> definitely uh, teaches you a few things. So, Looking forward to when it comes out, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Hello, my name's Dan, and this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about board games for children of around five and under. And today, we're going to talk to you about this game. What is it, Cora? Double. Double. <laughs> Double, or Spot It for the Chronically American, actually has a number of different mini games you can play but they can all be boiled down to the same thing. Racing to match up symbols on two different round cards. Through some sort of mathematic wizardry, the designers of Double have made it so that each and every card has got one symbol in common with every other card in the deck. So for example, here you can see that they've got a dinosaur in common. Double really is a modern classic, and it's a game we often give as a birthday present when one of the kids are invited to a party. Now, Cora's still a little bit too young to be truly competitive at this game, and so I tend to give myself a handicap when we play by counting to ten in my head before allowing myself to declare a match. But it's not going to be long until we're more evenly matched, like I am with her older brother and sister, and then she'll be able to beat me completely on her own terms. So, Cora, what do you think about Double? I think it's good. Why do you like it? It's kind of like sla Snap and I like Snap. It is a bit like Snap, isn't it? It's really quite tricky to um, to see the thing sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, I was stuck on... I had a ladybird and he just went slow motion. So <laughs> I, I just realised it. Yeah, 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 you got there just, just, just before I could. It's a classic game. It's one that's available everywhere um, and very, very popular. But there's a reason for its popularity. It's really good for people of all ages and also of all kind of gaming proclivities. Um, really recommend it. It's called Spot It in America. Did you know that? Hmm? You're around wacky Americans. Um, and we give it two thumbs up. Boop. So, when is it time to do it? Take that game you never managed to play off the shelf, take it out back, and go all old yellow on it in the garage where the kids can't see. And I would say spoiler alert, 
but Old Yeller died in 1957 and that Labrador was in like three other films and the Mickey Mouse Club and his real name was Spike. Who knew? Although, I mean, for a Labrador, I mean, even like 12 years is a pretty good inning. So by now, Old Yellow is, it's, that's, that's not, but when is it time to go and, you know, metaphorically set a game on fire? And by metaphorically, I mean figuratively. And by on fire, I mean whack it on eBay. This was a big decision for me when it came to a game called Mission Red Planet 2nd Edition, which was one of the first games I ever bought, but it just never got played. It just sat on the shelf being passed over like steamed rice at an all-you-can-eat buffet. And eventually, I just gave up on it. Like Artax giving up on life in the swamp of sadness. Oh, Artax, you were such a good horse. So how long is it before you finally give up on that game that's been sat on your shelf of shame? That took more than one attempt to get right. A year? Is that, is that long enough? It seems like quite a long time. So let me know in the comments below. And if you're a Dice Tower card, come say hello. Because, you know, I'll be there. Being, you know, just being there around. It's cool. Have a great week. All right, folks. Well, that's it for another board game breakfast. I'm going to be getting ready here as soon as we're done recording this. We're going to continue to pack up and get ready for Dice Tower Con. And I will see many of you there. As I always say, please come by and say hi to me. Although it's harder to not do that at Dice Tower Con. Um, but anyway, it's going to be a super fun week. And then when we come back, we're going to be back on reviewing and showing you guys more stuff. When we do come back next week, though, there will be a few days hiatus because the Dice Tower team is going to take a few days off. Dice Tower Con is a lot of fun for us, but it's not really a vacation of sorts because we got to get a lot of things done while we're there and running events and so on. So a few days off, but then we'll be back in full force all the way up to the big Gen Con uh, review. So with that in mind, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.